Next up, we have Michael Gear. He spent five years uh, helping create and build the largest dating site in the world, bringing the company to over 70 million users. He left Badu in 2010 and found himself in New York, uh, successfully fighting against uh, SOPA and PIPA, two laws going through uh, US Congress that would have killed the internet as we know it. That experience uh, drove him to join and now help run uh, the largest consumer VPN uh, in the world, uh, Anchor Free, uh, to fight internet censorship and protect the open internet and free flow of information and communication worldwide. A huge round of applause to Michael. Thank you, Nora, uh, and uh, thank you to Celia and Camila and Alf and all the all the team that are you know bringing us together to have these great talks. Uh, it's it, it's it's amazing that you every time I go to one of these, you you, you come away with an expanded kind of understanding of of, of the world and and ways that we can kind of combat different problems. Uh, so I'll start with a confession. Uh, and the confession uh, is, you know, usually best done in front of, you know, 150 of your closest friends and cameras. Uh, my name is Michael Gear. That, that you know already. That's not the confession. My name is Michael Gear, and I believe in the goodness of humanity. And you know, sometimes that's that's hard to admit in front of people. And so, as as Nora mentioned, so I, I run the largest, you know, consumer VPN in the world. We have hundreds of millions of people. Uh, connecting to a bunch of our different apps. We have Hotspot Shield, BetterNet, a bunch of different others. Um, and we fight every day against censorship and uh, we fight for the open internet, this flow of information, this flow of communication, especially in places where it's quite restricted. That's not what I'm specifically going to talk to you about today. And uh, because of that, uh, I'm giving this talk for the first time because it, it, it's, it struck me that I needed to, and it, you know, kind of lines up with what Kat Katerina and Tina were, were talking about, it struck me that I, there's a very fundamental thing uh, that keeps us from solving a lot of these, these world problems. Uh, the, what we do is it's, it's an us versus them. You know, we, we artificially create these divisions between ourselves and this other group. And because of that, we're not able to effectively tackle some of these larger problems that takes all of us. So, you're, you know, hunger, poverty, climate change, you know, you name it. You know, we, it needs all of us, and the second we start dividing ourselves into this us versus them, you know, we're not able to resolve conflicts as quickly, we're not able to solve problems as quickly, we're not able to, you know, basically make, uh, create more good in the world. And so, when I was coming over here, uh, when I was about to jump on the plane, I came across this research study, which basically, uh, I think is quite relevant to, to what we're doing here today. Uh, and so, before I jump into that, though, I wanted to... So, if a bunch of you came in, you might have noticed that you had a pin on your seat, or I might have handed it to you. Just looking if you have one. Uh, and so, if you have a pin that says, I'm a front, so not the ones that say, I'm a back, the ones that say, I'm a front, if you can stand up. If you're sitting directly next to a person that's standing up, you're allowed to stand up too, because you might have just missed your pin. <laughs> All right, so if you guys can kind of do like a quarter turn, kind of look at the people behind you, maybe cast an eye my way once in a while. Uh, so the study basically there's three things that jumped out, and this is a quite comprehensive study. It came out of Stanford, as you know, studies are apt to do. Uh, and so three things that jumped out. So what it was basically saying is, it did, I think it was about 5,000 people, quite comprehensive. It was saying, okay, if we look at where people sit in audiences, Nora, you can stand up too. <laughs> if we look at where people you know, sit in audiences, we can, we can pretty much, on average, get some traits that are, that are common, that are highly correlated, and not causation, but highly correlated with, the, with that group. And so uh, three of them that jumped out at me. And so the first one is that on average, 20 the people that sat in the front of audiences had a 20% higher score on IQ tests. Yeah, that sounds about right. 
Second one is that the people that sat in the front of audiences, as opposed to the, you know, the fronts, the, as opposed to the people that sat in the back, had 30% more close friends. And the definition is that is that they talk to them at least once a week. So 30% more close friends. The third one, and this might hurt more than the other two, is that they also surveyed the, the partners uh, of these people. And the third one said that the people that sat in the back of audiences, when they surveyed their partners, their partners said that they were 40% less satisfied in bed than the people that sat in front of audiences. I, <laughs> Plum, and you're allowed to stand up. You're next to someone with a... <laughs> and I'm wearing his T-shirt. And so, yeah, I saw a couple of people wince on that one and not on the other two. And so if, if you guys can, the fronts can turn around and, and look at the, the backs, backs, look at the fronts. Just, you know, how does this make you feel? What are you thinking about the other group? Do you think it's true? So, oh, sorry, there, there was a fourth thing that, that really jumped out at me, is that I completely made up this study. It's complete bullshit. <laughs> that was the most important thing. All right, you guys can sit down. Thank you for participating. And so, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I want to kind of I'll, I'll convey you know, what, what I think some of you were thinking in these two groups. So if you're in the fronts, you're thinking, you start to think, like, like, like you voiced, you know, yeah, I could see that, yeah. <laughs> you, you, look at, you look at the people behind you, and you're like, eh, I might be smarter than them. I'm definitely better in bed than that guy. You know, you start to kind of believe that if you're sitting in the back, you're looking at the fronts, especially since they're standing and looking at you, you'd be like, who are these fucking assholes? Am I allowed to say that? You know, why are they better? You know, they're not better than me. But then in the back of your head, you might be thinking, wait a second, yeah, that, that first one sounds, you know, maybe, maybe they are a little bit more intelligent because they sat in the front. I always sat in the back during lectures in university. So you start to, it starts to get in your head a little bit. And then you're, you know, generally you start thinking, okay, well, you know, us as a group, the backs, we need to, we need to, we need to come up against these, these fronts because these, these people are, you know, you know, we, they need to be stopped from their, their false, you know, false thoughts. And so just a quick example, you know, 150 of us, I, th I think that's the number, came into this room, and we're just completely, you know, we're completely committed to solving the world's problems, and we're ready to really engage. And then so easily, we're able to divide ourselves and, and believe, you know, a completely made-up, you know, BS study by a person that, you know, most of you have never met before. And because of that, we're unable we would be, we will be able to, obviously, but we would be unable to fully interact with each other, and we'd cut off about half of our allies, you know, in the room. And so, and I know what you're thinking, okay, MG, you know, yeah, yeah, great, you know, nice little exercise, but, you know, we're very open-minded people, and we, you know, we see that, and yeah, there's probably, there's people out there, they're in an echo chamber, I'm not so much, but they're in an echo chamber. And so I want to give a couple more examples just to, you know, see if any of these kind of resonate with you. So the first one is, so unfortunately, even though you guys are mostly <laughs> living over here in Europe, unfortunately it, guys, it gets thrown in your face every once in a while. You might know. So in the U.S. we have the Democrats and the Republicans. We have these two parties. And I'm not going to name, you know, the one person that, that was named before. The Democrats and the Republicans. And, you know, it's Democrats versus Republicans, Republicans versus Democrats. So to give you an example, I, you know, I, like I said, I, I fight for the open Internet, and usually I'm doing that just by, you know, making our technology better and getting it distributed further. But I was in D.C. about three weeks ago, and so there's, there's a lot of legislation coming out about net neutrality, and we're trying to really lock it down so that it's protected in the U.S. And so I was meeting with basically, you know, a couple Democrats in the morning, different congresswomen and congressmen, and a couple of Republicans in the afternoon. So within a span of maybe like three or four hours, I'm sitting in an office with a with you know high-ranking Democrat, and in the afternoon I'm sitting in an office with high-ranking you know Republicans. And what struck me on this particular issue is that I'd be talking to them, and in a couple of them I was I was I was friends with, and so you know maybe they were just being nice to me, but they were basically saying, yeah, Mike, I yeah I agree with you, yeah on this, you know their their staffer would be sitting next to them and being like, yes, we 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 agree with that initiative, and you know we're 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 looking to do something, but without fail every single one of them would stop at some point in the conversation and just be like, yeah, I agree with you, but there's no way they are going to allow us to do this. They don't agree. And I had just been in that 
person at the referencing office like three hours ago and they said that they did agree. And so just an example of how like this particular issue, the net neutrality, like there's so much support for it on both sides, but we've divided ourselves into the us versus them. And because of that, we're struggling to get, get any legislation passed that would protect it. Something maybe a little bit closer to home. Uh, so Russia versus Europe. Europe versus Russia. And sometimes US versus Russia. Basically, you have this situation, again, that we're dividing ourselves into us versus them. But if you, just as an example, so if you got on a, a plane today, here from Oslo, you go over to Moscow, and whatever your particular you know, sector of interest is, is it climate change, is it, is it hunger, poverty, any, any big issue that you're working on, or if you got on a plane and you know, jumped from Moscow over here to Oslo, you wouldn't be able to spend more than two hours in a couple like, hey, does anybody know anybody in Moscow that you know, is interested in this? You wouldn't be able to spend more than two hours without finding a ton of people that agree with you, are working on the same thing, and by dividing ourselves into this us first them, this, you know, the Russians and the, and the Europeans, we're again kind of dividing ourselves away from all these allies that can help us with all these issues. Another issue that I, I think we're, we're talking, especially, you know, we're going into the Arctic, uh, we're talking a lot about climate change. And this one might, you know, be the more contentious one. And so, what do you have in climate change? You have generally whatever you want to call the first group, you know, people that are fighting for, you know, reducing climate change, you know, reversing it, keeping, keeping the earth uh, in a good state, you know, the environmentalists on one side, and then you have the, you know, whatever you, you know, the oil companies on the other side. So you got the environmentalists and the oil companies. And again, you have this kind of situation that we immediately cut off, divide ourselves, and we're not able to kind of tap into all the allies that do exist on the other side. And so if you think about it, you know, what a, just because I think most of us are probably like on the environmentalist side in, in, this, in this room, you think about it, okay, who's spending a bunch of money on renewable energy because they don't want to go out of business in, in 20 years? Who, you know, has distribution channels for energy? You know, you have a bunch of people that could be great allies on this other side. And that doesn't mean that you need to trust them, it doesn't mean, that, you know, anything like that, but you need to engage with them, right? And, but again, we're kind of, you know, us versus them. We have... You know, probably the, the classic and probably, you know, one of the saddest examples is you have, you know, Israel and Palestine. It's just one that we can never solve. So you have over and over again in the world, you have this us versus them, this divi artificial dividing. We're not going to engage with the other side. We can't. They, they don't agree with us. We, we are doing the right thing. They are not. And so if we're always doing this, we're not able to kind of tap into all these allies that we have, you know, that we, that we want to deal with. And so, I just want to propose, you know, one solution. And one thing that I want us to take away from this is in this room today, and you guys can spread it to the, to the others here, let's just do one thing. And I think Katerina, you know, and Katerina and Tina have kind of touched on topics like this. Let's just start noticing when someone that we're talking to that in many cases we're probably going to agree with, someone that we're talking to uses one of these frameworks, this us versus them framework. Let's just notice. And then as we're going around, and, and please feel free to kind of obnoxiously yell at this, this at me when I'm going around, just be like, MG, three times, three times. I, I notice it three times, two times. Just, just yell it at me, yell it at each other, you know, whatever. And if we start like that, we can start to reduce, just by noticing, we can start to reduce our own use of this us versus them, we can, we can, you know, spread it to our friends, help them reduce it. And we're able to, we'll get to a point where we're able to, you know, resolve more conflicts, solve more problems, and create more good in the world on all these big issues, you know, hunger, poverty, climate change. If we don't do that, and we divide ourselves into these two groups all the time, we're cutting off all these allies. And so, if you have the pins, and much like artificial divisions made by made by humans, which Yuval, in his books, uh, talk about quite a bit. The thing that let us rise up against the Neanderthals is the same thing that's killing us now. Uh, you can very easily pop off, well, maybe not too easily, I'll help you if you, you have trouble. You can pop it off, and you can basically switch out the, you know, the fronts, I'm sure a few of the fronts will keep the fronts, but you can switch out, <laughs> you can switch it out and put I'm a human at the front, pop it back on, and, you know, 
And since I'm a cool speaker, I get the bigger one. <laughs> and we can go around and we can actually interact as humans. And a lot of like-minded people here, so this is probably even more effective. You know, like Katerina and Tina were talking about, we need to engage. You need to look for your allies on the other side. And we're going to be able to do a lot more good in the world if we do so. So, thank you. <laughs>